Okay, um, so before we start a new topic, I'm just gonna mention the examples in the textbook related to functions of two variables plotted here. The first one, as you can see, is the product of minus xy times the exponential of a to the Gaussian, with the argument of the exponential being minus x squared plus y squared multiplied by 25. Here you do not have a rotation symmetry because you have the factor xy, but you see precisely that the, uh, the sign changes accordingly to x and y. That's why you have this modulation. And look, these different views could be accomplished actually if you plot a function of these sorts in MATLAB, which lets you just rotate and zoom over the region. Um, the plot in the upper top left, uh, that actually is a surface of revolution. If you see the function is set equal to minus exponential of minus three x squared plus y squared, so you have this rotation symmetry, and basically what you have is the plot of uh, uh, e minus three x squared rotated, and you have this surface of revolution. So you rotate around this set. Uh, some of the others cannot be accomplished by rotation, which is evident from the symmetries that they have, like those two. Um, the last two are common examples, um, especially these two, before giving the formula, if you think about it, you have a hyperbola in the plane, and you can rotate two possible ways, in a way that you generate two cones or one single cone. That is precisely how you achieve the symmetry, right? When you get the single cone, if you think about it, the variable that you're considering is x squared plus y squared, so you're doing a surface of revolution around the z-axis, that's why it has that symmetry. In the other case, um, actually, if you notice, well, okay, so there's a factor of 10, so this is minus 10 times x squared plus y squared, but it's generating the parallel with two cones. The last example is an ellipsoid. Here, the argument is not related to x squared plus y squared, but both to y squared plus z squared. So actually, this is also a surface of revolution, but it's obtained by revolving the 2D plot around the x-axis. That's why you have this symmetry of y squared plus z squared, right? Imagine that you do the revolution around the x-axis, and you get. So those are typical examples, just to give you an overview. Um, of course, there are plenty of computational tools that you can generate. Of course, I mean, this is the simplest for a first year student. Just go to the online version of Mathematica, which is Wolfram Alpha, which does this plot, for example, of the minus exponential of minus three r squared, where r squared is x squared plus y squared. You have the same shape, it's just in a different zoom. If you want to show the contour, lines, well, of course, the contour lines basically for the same value of x squared plus y squared, which are circles around the origin of a given radius, you get the same value. So, of course, those are the contours. That contour plot is shown here. Again, over the values of the circle, or over the contour, you have the same value of the function. So, there are plenty of tools. This is not a course related to that, but I just want to show you the options and the possibilities of something that you might face later on. So now we start a new topic, which is related to partial derivatives. Um, let's wait a little bit for, okay. So this is a new section. And basically, since we have functions of two variables, we are gonna extend the concept of derivative that we had for a function of one variable, noticing that the function can change with respect to x or to y. So, this is actually related to something that is called the gradient, but we will go step by step. So suppose that you have a function of two variables z equal to f of x, y, and we're gonna make a definition. So the partial derivative of f with respect to x so there is a notation for this, and it's denoted by, there is a delta symbol in this way, z, divided by delta x if you want. There is also another notation. There are plenty of notations. I mean, it really depends on the discipline that you're working on, if you're on the physics orientation or the math orientation. 
one possible notation is also fx with respect to xy. So there's an index x is indicating that you're going to take a derivative of this function with respect to x while keeping y constant. So that's what we're going to explain. <laughs> so this is a notation for an object that we're going to define right now. So that is the function obtained by differentiating f with respect to x, treating y as a constant. So if you think about it, okay, we have a function of two variables, right? So far we don't know how to extend the concept of derivatives, but if you take y as constant, then you have a function of one variable because y is constant, so it only depends on x. And for that, you know how to take the derivative. And it turns out that for functions of two variables, these derivatives where you take one of the values constant are actually pretty useful. Um, maybe we'll see that later. But essentially, you construct something that is called the gradient, and later on, the same way that the derivative is related to the tangent line with the same slope at a point, for surfaces, what you can do is to have a tangent plane. So that is why these objects, such as partial derivatives, are really useful. Because at the end of the day, the derivative in one dimensions, well, in one dimension, in two dimensions, or in many dimensions, it's essentially a linear function that is approximating locally the function. That's all. It happens in 1D with the line. It happens in 2D with the plane. It happens uh, in n variables, if you want, with a hyperplane. So that will be the idea. In any case, there is another concept, which is the partial derivative of f with respect to y is denoted by, so this is a notation. So you have the delta z over delta y, or also the notation f with the subscript y, xy. So there are different notations for the same thing. And it is the function obtained by differentiating f with respect to y, treating x as a constant. Okay? So again, we don't know so far how to take derivatives in two variables, but in one variable we can. And if we keep one of the variables constant, such as x, we can compute this partial derivative. Now, um, because these definitions involve the concept of derivative in 1D, we will refresh the concept of derivative in 1D to show the extension in 2D for these functions. So the mental note is essentially that you should remember that the derivative of a function of one variable, so going back to the 1D case that we studied before, f of x is defined by the limit, which is the following. f prime of x, if you remember, is defined as a limit. The limit as h approaches zero of the quotient f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So it's the limit of this ratio of how much f changes when x changes, right? So since the mm, concepts for the partial derivatives involve the 1D concept, we will now make the definitions according to this. So the partial derivative f subscript x I'm going to call it later fx, but for the moment I'm just trying to 
say little by little. So fx, xy is the limit as h approaches zero. And now remember, by definition, what you do when you take the partial derivative with respect to x is that you consider y as a constant, and then you take the derivative with respect to x, okay? So this is the limit as h approaches zero of, okay, x changes, but y is constant. So I do this quotient, okay? y is kept constant, x is changing, so of course it's gonna be the quotient if you remember the definition you want to take of the change on f due to the change in x because y is constant divided by the change in x which is h. And equivalently, the partial derivative fy is defined by the limit. So fy xy is the limit as h approaches zero. But now, in the partial with respect to y, x is constant and y is changing. So you have x, y plus h minus f of xy divided by h, right? Is it clear? Yeah? I mean, for the moment you keep one constant and then you return to the one constant. This will be enough to construct this linear approximation to a function in two variables, which is essentially a plane. But later on, we'll see. So in terms of the definitions, we have mathematically defined what they are. Of course, if the limit exists, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, but part of the philosophy of the course is to learn by doing. So we will do a computation in order to land these concepts. And if you look at example or exercise 7.2.1, you have to find the partial derivative, f sub x and f sub y, if f of x, y is equal to x squared plus two x, y squared plus two y over three x. So, in terms of the solution, well, you can simplify this, well, maybe because you're gonna do several variables, it's not a bad idea to just write this in the form two thirds y and then x to the minus y. Now, you have the thing that in some cases you will take y as constant and the other is x as constant, so depends on the case, of course, right? But f sub x is the case where you treat y as a constant and you differentiate with respect to x. So you have f sub x of x and y, take the derivative, right? So take this term, first two x, then y is a constant. So you have two y squared because according to this, I mean the dependence on x is zero. Then you have this, right? So the y is constant, so this is just a constant, and then you have x to the minus one. So you have minus, and then, okay, the other constant, x to the minus two, right? Minus one, x to the minus two, the loss for the form. Now, you can write it in a nice fashion way, so which is two x plus two y squared, and then minus two y divided by three x squared. That's according to what x to the minus two is. Um, the same technique is done for fy, but now you treat x as a constant. And you differentiate with respect to y. So let's look at the object. Right, so, okay, fy, depending on x and y, I mean, if you notice, basically, for fx and fy, you again get functions of x and y. Just a few points that you can look here. Um, well, let's go to the first term, right? The first term has no y dependence, so as regards to y, it is a constant, because we're taking x as a constant, so that doesn't, 
is not taken into account, it's put as zero. Then for this term, 2x is a constant, and then you have y squared, so you have the y squared dependent, so yeah, basically four, because it's two times two, x, and then y, which is two y times two x, right? Then you have, well, basically one over three x, because, well, and then times two y, so this is two thirds, two over three x, because you have the linear dependence. Um, so if, well, you can write this in those ways, so for example, four x y plus two over three x, you could also use the x to the minus one, etc. But the procedure is this. When I focus on fx, I keep y as a constant, and I do the one derivative. And I compute xy, partial derivative of f with respect to y, I keep x as a constant, and I take the derivative with respect to y, which is what we have done, and we use the previous rules that we already knew um, for derivatives in 1b. Okay. Um, so is the concept clear so far? Yeah? All right, so we will do another example. partial derivatives partial of set with respect to x and partial of set with respect to y so think that the exercises are also trying to get you used to the notation for set equal to x squared plus xy plus y all these to the fifth power. So, okay, let's do the first one, right? Partial of set with respect to x. So, what you're gonna do, well, you have all, oh, sorry, no. have all these objects to the fifth power, you're gonna use the chain rule. So the part where this thing of, in this case, taking y as a constant and taking the derivative with respect to x, is gonna happen when you compute the last term related to the chain rule. Well, for the moment, basically this is five times the object x squared plus x y plus y to the fourth power, and then times the derivative of this stuff. I mean, if you think about it, basically what you would do is basically the derivative with respect to x of the object, which is x squared plus x y plus y, right? That is the chain rule at this point, because I'm taking derivatives of numbers. Um, so of course, well, I have five times this object, and then let's do the computation. Okay, the first term depends on x, and the derivative is 2x. In the second one, y is a constant, you have a linear dependence, so this is y, right? In the third one, well, y is taken as a constant. It's not a function of x, so it's not taken into account, and I finish, right? Is it clear? What am I doing? Okay. So, that is one computation. Um, please notice that basically this is the result of the partial derivative of the argument with respect to x, where you take the derivative with respect to x and y is a constant. Now, the partial of set with respect to y, so again, chain rule, right? So five times the object, x squared plus xy plus y to the fourth power, but now, we times the derivative with respect to y of the object, which is x squared plus xy plus y. Again, we're taking x as a constant, we're taking derivatives with respect to y, and we just have to use the chain, as in one. Okay? So this is five times x squared plus xy plus y to the fourth power. The first term does not depend on y. And for the practical effects, we're taking x as a constant, so it doesn't appear. In the second one, you have xy. So the constant here goes, because, well, this is a linear function with respect to y, and then you have plus y, right? Derivative of y with respect to y is y. Again, notice that this is the result of the partial derivative of the object with respect to y. So it is very methodical in a way. If you 
I mean, maybe just to keep an observation because it's the first time that you see the concept. What you're doing is you're treating y as a constant and differentiating with respect to x. In the second case, the x is the constant. So you're treating x as a constant and you differentiate with respect. I'm going to use WRT, which is the usual way you abbreviate with respect to y. Okay. The procedure is the same, it's just a different function. You have to remember the chain rule. And again, part of the goal is to get you used to the notation. These notations can appear, it's basically to the choice of the writer of the paper or the community. So to get used to both is the idea. Okay. Uh, so is the methodology clear for everybody? Yeah? Okay. So we'll do one last example before we give some geometrical interpretation. And it is example 7.2.3, which asks you to find if x, if y, if f of x, y is equal to x times exponential of minus 2 x, y. Okay? So, let's do it for the solution. First, let's consider f x, f x, y, again. Um, the partial derivatives are also functions of two variables in general. Of course, you can have constant cases, etc. Well, again, because now we're more familiar with the technique. For fx, y is a constant. You take derivatives with respect to x. So this is a product, right? In the first one, you can take the derivative of this one, which would be 1 times the exponential, and then times x times the derivative of the exponential. Now, the constant that I can find is dx is minus 2y, because y is the constant, so this is minus 2y, exponential of minus 2xy. Right? Because we're treating y as a constant. This is a constant multiplying x minus 2y, so it comes out. So you can factorize this, actually. Um, so this is exponential of minus 2xy. Then you have 1, and then minus 2xy. Right? So I just realized that the exponential is a common factor. I have a minus, which is here. And then I have x minus 2y, which is here. Um, for fy, possibly things will be simpler because for practical terms, the only term that depends on y is the exponential. So this is a constant because we're taking x as a constant. So this doesn't affect, you don't have to do the product rule. So basically, the derivative of dx with respect to y would be zero because we're taking x as a constant. So this is x times, in this case, minus 2x because that is the constant that is accompanying y. And then, exponential of minus 2xy, right? So you have minus 2x squared, exponential of minus 2xy. Okay? Again, in this case, x is a constant derivative with respect to y. That's why this term is the one that comes out. Okay? Yeah, have the constant, which is minus 2x, multiplying the y, and the constant. Okay? So, so far, so good? Yeah? All right. So, Look, the concept is new, of course. The only way to learn is by practice, so. Um, I mean, the computation is direct in a way, but you just have to keep in mind what is constant and what is the variable, that's all. Um, regarding conceptual interpretations, of course, so we can think of what is this object, right? So we can think of the geometrical or geometric interpretation of partial derivative. So this is a concept. And look, um, before I give the whole punchline, this is the story. Think about what we're doing. We have a function of two variables. We're keeping, for example, for fx. y is a constant, and we take derivative with respect to y. What does y being a constant mean? That you're basically looking at the plane where y has a constant value. And on the other hand, you have your surface. 
So what you're going to have is an intersection. Now, imagine that you have a surface and you have a plane. When you intersect a surface with a plane, you will get a curve. Now, that curve, because y is constant, only depends on x. And when you take the derivative with respect to x, basically what you're doing is computing the slope of that curve, which is the result of the intersection, with respect to x. That is, in a nutshell, the problem. What I'm going to do is just to argue now and do some drawing that makes it clear. But in your mind, if you have imagined which are the process, having surface, having plane, intersect, getting curve, getting slope, that is the partial derivative. And you're done. So let me write the following. If z equal is equal to the function of two variables x, y, and for example, if y is kept constant or fixed, if you want, at the value y equal to y naught, so again, you can rewrite the notation, y naught, the intersection of our surface z equal f of x, y, with the plane y equal to y naught is a curve it's, just, it's in the 3D space, of course. But formally speaking, it's a curve. In the same way, when you intersect two planes, you get a line where you basically reduce from 2D to 1D. With the surface and a plane, you will get again a curve, which is a 1D object, although it lives in 3D space. So it's a curve in 3D space. And then partial of z with respect to x is simply the slope tangent to this curve. curve sorry. Um, in the plane, I will make a figure because maybe it gets too lengthy. Anyway, y equal to y naught at a given point x naught y naught. So, um, and yeah, I mean just to summarize. Partial set with respect to x, slope of the tangent line in the x direction. So let me make a drawing to try to um, make evident the concept. So maybe this would be good. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis. Mm, okay, four, four, or something like this, anyway. I'm just gonna draw a surface and then I will make all this procedure, okay? So just one second. Let's imagine that we had this surface, right? We can imagine it. So, what I will do now is take a value of y naught, and then I'm gonna consider the plane, all the points in the 3D space for which the y coordinate is equal to y naught. So they live over here. Yeah, it's not perfect, but I try. So, just imagine the plane, and then imagine the intersection of that plane with the surface, which is gonna give me perhaps something like this. Right, can you imagine that? Yeah? So, you have this plane, let's imagine. Yeah, right. The set of points for which the y coordinate is the same. It's parallel in a way to this other plane, right? Now, I intersect the surface with this, so I get this curve. Now, for the uh, purposes or for the sake of the argumentation, it's precisely geometrically what we have defined mathematically before. The y component is taken as a constant because we live in the space with the same values y naught. Then this is a function of the one variable, which would be x. So z with the y equal to y naught, the same constant is this curve. And then if I study the slope in a given point, for example, this one, well, if you think about it, this is the point that I focus on. This is the tangent line. So just to um, point some concepts, this is the surface, 
z equal f of xy, this would be the plane y equal to y naught. This is the resulting curve. Um, z equal f of x, so it depends on x, but the y is constant with the value y naught. This is a point which is going to be the point x naught, y naught, c naught. And, well, if you think about it, this is the tangent line. This would be the slope. So the computation that you get from partial set with respect to x is the slope in the x direction. Okay? So you see? With the intersection, you got a function of one variable. And now what you did is basically find the tangent line and compute the slope. That's the geometry. Um, the argumentation for the partial with respect to y is equivalent. I'll try to do it in the remaining space. Okay. So one sec. Um, maybe. Okay. Maybe I just have enough space left. So again, I'm going to draw my space. X, Y, Z. Again, a surface. I'm just choosing this surface because perhaps it's convenient for the illustration. It can be any other. The argument would be the same. So let's say I have this right now. I take, for the concept of partial offset with respect to y, x is constant, right? So let's assume that I take this value, x naught. For the points where x is constant, the plane would be parallel to this other plane. I mean, if you think about it, basically, the yz plane is the plane for which x is equal to 0. So this is just parallel with a different value set. Um, now, the intersection of that plane, which I will illustrate here, basically this, with the surface, will give me a curve. Okay, can you see that? I mean, is, it, is this clear geometrically of the intersection? Okay. So, again, I'll have the point, I have the slope, so this is the point x naught, y naught, c, z naught. This would be the plane x equal to x naught. This would be the surface z equal f of x y. And the tangent over here has a slope partial set with respect to y. Because y is changing, so this is the variable that is changing, and x is constant. So this is basically the slope in the y direction. So that is pretty much the geometric concept. If you, if it's the first time you see this, perhaps we won't see all this in detail, but it's hard to imagine that from only these two computations you could get the information basically of the function locally, not only in x and y, but in general around, in a local matrix. Actually, you can do it for functions which are differentiable, so there are some conditions for that. But essentially, this procedure later on will be equivalent to finding a tangent plane to the surface. And you can define the equation for the tangent plane and what you're doing there is basically to find the local approximation, which is linear. And these uh, constants, partial set with respect to y, partial set with respect to x at a given point, are related to the constants defined in the plane. That is the sum. So that is the geometric interpretation. Um, yeah, so I mean, the concept for partial set with respect to y is equivalent. I guess that's clear for everybody at this point. Is there any question? Or is this becoming clear? And the topic is very geometric, so I think that helps a lot with the intuition. But if there's a question, please let me know. Okay? So, now we go to the applications. One of the applications should be for marginal analysis, which appears in economics. And 
it's the practice of using a derivative to estimate the change in the value of a function resulting from a one unit increase in one of the variables. I mean, if you think about it, we did that kind of stuff in 1D, where I made all this argumentation that the Leibniz notation was useful because the derivative was this approximation to the quotient and we took a change in x equal to one. Well, we will do that, but now in the case of functions of two variables where either x changes by one or y changes by one. So we will do one example, which, well, the idea is basically to use marginal analysis to study output. So the statement of the problem is the following. The weekly output of a plant is given by a production plant, of course, q of x, y equal to 1200x plus 500y plus x squared y minus x cubed minus y squared. We have to define two variables. This is in terms, well, the, of units. <coughs> and x is the number of skilled workers and y is the number of unskilled workers. So we're we're just given them all at the production plant. I mean, if you think about this for a second, well, I don't know. basically when you lose the skilled workers, um, the decrease is bigger, right? Or values of x greater than one, I think. And then, well, this is linear, this is linear, the coefficient is bigger for the skilled workers. And also when you have the mixed terms, like the combination, basically you have a square factor. So, I mean, I do not work in this discipline, but in terms of the model kind of makes sense because it's saying that the skilled workers increase the production more than the unskilled people. It kind of makes sense. I don't work in this, I don't make this model. Somehow, um, it has some physics to say it. You know. um, so, the data is that you have a workforce of 30 skilled workers and 60 unskilled workers, so that's information for x and y. So basically, x equal to 30, y equal to 60. And the indication is that by marginal analysis, we had to estimate the change in the weekly output that will result from the addition of one more skilled worker if the number of unskilled workers is not changed. So, well, I mean, by assumption, the problem is being reduced from 2D to 1D, right? I mean, it's basically given to us to apply the concept of partial derivatives because it's telling you that Y is kept constant, but the X is changing by one. And so the problem being equivalent in, one, equivalent in 1D, it's essentially, it's like the one problem in 1D that we did where by computing the derivative, we measure the quantity because increasing x was one. So I'll just show this in a sec. 
So the solution to the problem is to consider the function q of x, y, again, all this stuff, 2,000, well, actually, we have to do the computation. So everybody can see up to there and also here, right? Okay. So let's compute Qx, right? So the first term, 12,000. The second depends on y. So y is a constant. So we're computing the partial derivative of Q with respect to x. So it doesn't appear. It's equal to a zero if you want. Then you have plus 2x times y. Then you have minus 3x squared. Then the other one is here. You have 1200 plus 2xy minus 3x squared. So, of course, we made this choice because the change is in x, not in y. Um, there's also the notation partial q with respect to x, which is a function of two variables x and y. Um, and, well, perhaps this is not all in the book, but I think it's basically putting in the equations all the paragraphs that they wrote. So if you think about it, partial of q with respect to x, okay, with the function of two variables, it's basically, remember the limit, right? So for h small, it's not the same as the limit, but it's approximate. So this partial derivative, it's approximate to q of x plus delta x. I'm calling basically h delta x in this case because it will be evident. y minus q of x, y, divided by delta x. Well, this one is the limit when h or delta x approaches zero. This is just a fixed value of delta x or h, which is gonna be one. So they're not the same, but they're close. And usually the reason you do this is because it's fa it is faster to do the computation of the partial derivative than to actually evaluate the difference. That's the whole reason. Especially if you deal with polynomials, um, with polynomials you reduce a degree, so that would make more sense. Um, so if you think about it, this is delta Q divided by delta X, but we are assuming, of course, that delta X is basically X plus one minus X, because we ch just change one unit of the skill coordinates. So this is one. The change in X is just one, that's clear. So in that case, because delta X is equal to one, in that case, partial Q with respect to X of X, Y is basically approximate to Q of X plus one, Y minus Q of X, Y, which is delta Q, okay? Um, well, so the change Basically, the partial derivative in this case is a faster way to compute the change without evaluating the functions in the two points. So this would be Q of, think about it, x is equal to 30, y is equal to 60. You change x in one, so this is Q of 31, comma 60, minus Q of 30, comma 60. So this is an equality. And then you do the approximation, which is just to evaluate the partial derivative at those points precisely, at 30, and at 60, because the change is unitary. So the delta x is one, so. It's uh, the rate of change gives you the value in this case. And so you can do the computation now going to this form. So delta q, let's do the computation, right? So it's 1200 plus two times x, which is 30, times y, which is 60, minus three, then 30 squared, okay? So 1200, so 60 times 60, then you have minus three, well, this is 900. So basically, well, if you do the addition, etc., etc., you have 2100. Basically, you can add these two, and that would be the difference with that, right? So you have 4700 minus 2000, well, sorry. 4,800 minus 2,700, so 2,100. Um, and well, you have the units, etc., whichever units. So this is just a way to get an approximation. Um, of course, this is approximate to the actual value, which is the difference. If you want to practice, you can compute this with the polynomial that you were given before, which was over here. 
and you can measure the degree of the approximation. It's an approximate calculation, but look, there are two ways to learn in general calculus, derivatives, etc. You can have the formal, super formal mathematical approach, which is essentially a course in analysis, or you can do this. And actually, in terms of applications, this one is more useful because mm, this lets you compute approximations pretty quickly. Again, if you introduce this in a computer and you have a polynomial, the degree of the polynomial will be less. Maybe it will be less expensive. Secondly, sometimes it's just faster to take the derivative for simple function and to evaluate with the partial the difference in a problem even like as velocity or as distance traveling and unit time than actually evaluating the function. So that shows that you have a little bit of uh, skill in terms of how to compute things quickly. That's just uh, to keep in your mind. Okay, it's an approximation, but sometimes it's convenient to have the approximation quickly. Um, so, continuing with these concepts, because we have finished the problem, we have a output function depending on k and l. So this is the output of a production process. involving the expense or expenditure, whichever you want to call it, of k units of capital and L units of labor. So remember we had these models with this curve with the exponents, etc. Then partial of Q with respect to K, which is a function of K and L again, that has a name and it's called marginal productivity of capital. Again, because what is changing is the capital and the L is kept, is kept constant. And then partial of Q with respect to L, which is a function of these two variables, it is called marginal productivity of labor. Again, for the partial with respect to L, the K is kept constant, and the only thing that changes, and the changes unitary in the marginal analysis, is the labor. So this is used in economic analysis, and the example that we will do is basically, um, again, an iteration of this uh, hop hops model that we saw before. Um, so, that would be example 7.2.5 related to marginal productivity of capital and labor. And the statement of the problem goes like this. We have a monthly output of a factory and it is given by a function which has a name that we've talked about three classes ago, the Cobb Douglas function with particular choices of constant which is Q of K and L equal to 50 times k to the point 0.4 times l to the point 0.6. Notice that the sum of the exponents is one, right? As these conditions of alpha and beta than we had before. And defining the units, etc. k is the capital expenditure in units of $1,000 and L is the size of the labor force, which is measured in worker hours. So the statement of the first uh, part is to find 
find the marginal productivity. of the capital, which is QK, and the marginal productivity of labor, which is Q with respect to L, when the capital expenditure is 750,000, and the level labor is 991 worker. So we'll state the problem like this. We'll continue next class. We have to cover the course coordinator. So review the concepts and we'll continue from here next.